Hello everyone, welcome to the monthly NRHS Iowa Chapter YouTube slideshow. If you're interested in more information about the Iowa Chapter, please visit iowanrhs.com. There you can join the chapter or renew your membership and order any of the great products that the Iowa Chapter has to offer, including DVDs and photo collections. Please enjoy the program this month and consider visiting iowanrhs.com. Hello, my name is Tom Hogan. I'm here with Dave Kroger today, and this is the July 2023 Iowa Chapter NRHS and Cedar Rapids Rail Fan Slideshow. Dave, um, would you consider yourself a frequent contributor to the... <laughs> To the Iowa Chapter YouTube page I, now? I guess so, yes. Welcome and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And we're, we're in June. It's not quite July yet. June, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, re I read my own slide wrong that I created. It's June 2023. So, yes. And we are here. Yes. Dave Kroger, president of the Iowa Chapter of NRHS. And Dave has a program that he's going to share with us today about, appropriately enough, a fallen flag, a fallen flag. from... The Iowa area, Iowa and Illinois. Yep. And that is going to be the Chicago Central and Pacific. So, Dave, why don't you give us a little background and then we'll jump into this. Well, this is a program, first of all, thank you, Tom, that I gave to um, folks in Boone uh, this past February for their speaker series at the Boone and Sink Valley Museum. And I've had quite a few requests since the program uh, was shown. It was also shown on Zoom, but I've had a lot of people... Tell me, you know, since then, hey, we'd like to see it somehow. So you uh, you approached me about doing it, and I said, sure, why not? So today for the next hour or so, or close to an hour, we're going to look at some uh, images of the Chicago Central, a fallen flag from the re regional boom of the Midwest from the 1980s. And uh, I followed the railroad pretty closely when the railroad started up in, in 1985, and we'll talk about that as the program goes. But um uh, there's several different photographers that uh, have uh, images in this program. Myself, Mark Lanuza from Munger, Illinois. Uh, my good friend, Ricky Anderson, who I got to know way back when. He was the former Chicago Central Rules guy. My friend, Lance Wales from the uh, NWI chapter, the NRHS over there in Rockford. And, of course, images from our chapter collection from the late Bill Kuba and the late Wilbur St. Peter. So, And Don Vaughn. And Don Vaughn, too, yes. yes. Can't forget Don. Well, this was right back in his backyard there yes. with the Mills Tower. The Mills Tower and everything like that, yes. So, shall we shall we enlighten our audience just a little bit to the background of the Chicago Central and Pacific? Sure. So, the Chicago Central Pacific traces its roots back to 1857 when the Dubuque and Pacific began running trains 29 miles from Dubuque to Dyersville, Iowa. Later called the Dubuque and Sioux City, it reached the latter... After the Civil War in 1870 and other lines were built throughout the 1870s and 1880s, and the main line to Council Bluffs was opened by 1899. Now, this is a 1960, early 1960s map of uh, Illinois Central Lines in Iowa. Of course, you have the D main line across to uh, Dubuque to Fort Dodge and Terra, and then the line splits to Terra, one going to Sioux City, one going to Council Bluffs, of course, and then at Cherokee, you had a line out to Sioux Falls and out of Cedar Falls you had a line up to Albert Lee, Minnesota and then out of Cherokee you had the branch down to went to Ottawa but at that time 1964 it was cut back to Anthon, Iowa and later cut back in the 1970s and the Sioux Falls line did uh, was cut back by the ICG prior to the Chicago Central sale in early 1980s. I think it was just months before they sold I the whole operation was, off. I remember right. Yep. Yeah, maybe maybe 1984. 84, I want to say, yes. Now, the ICI lines, a lot of people know, were famous for its passenger trains like the Land of Corn and the Hawkeye and also handled carloads of meat from the packing plants in Omaha, Sioux City, Sioux Falls, Fort Dodge, Waterloo, and Dubuque for the eastern markets. If you look at some of our, uh, like our L, uh, Andreessen video, the IC video, Lots of reefer cars with meat and fruit going east. And however, by the 1970s and the 80s, there was no longer passenger service in Iowa, and the meat traffic kind of began to dwindle down because a lot of the meat packing houses were closing, as did the overhead traffic from the Union Pacific. And by then, the UP was using the Northwestern pretty much for all its overhead traffic into Chicago. So in 1984, IC Industries began selling off some of its network of rail lines 
one of them being the Iowa main line, and a buyer was found on April 1st of 1985. And his name was Jack Haley, and he called his railroad the Chicago Central and Pacific. And this is an Omaha World Herald news uh, uh, newspaper clipping from about eight, April 3rd of 1985. It just kind of uh, explains how Haley got in the railroads. He was a... Uh, um, came from a family out in Nebraska that whose family worked for the Union Pacific. And then uh, he worked for the UP while going to college and then entered the Air Force, uh, retired as a lieutenant colonel in 1978, and then got into real estate. And then uh, when IC decided to sell its uh, Albert Lee line, he bought that first and called that Cedar Valley Railroad, which operated out of Waterloo up to Albert Lee. And they had a dinner train, too, which we'll, we'll see some photos of that later on, too. The Star Clipper. The Star Clipper. Here's another. This is a Chicago Tribune article. Shortly after the CC sale took place again, there's Jack uh, in front of a locomotive there, probably in Waterloo, just explaining how uh, this railroad revolution was taking shape. You know, he uh, uh, paid $75 million for the railroad, and first thing he did was, you know, try to get negotiations with all the labor unions he cut crew districts he, at one time he, there was four different crew districts he changed crews at wallace yard and freeport waterloo fort Dodge, and he went to either sioux city or, or council bluffs but then when he took over in, in 1985 he cut made he cut the cruise districts in half from crews ran from waterloo through freeport to chicago and crews ran waterloo through fort Dodge to either Sioux City or Omaha Council Bluffs. So this was uh this is a marketing brochure that explains how much uh that they bought or how much trackage the Chicago Central had at the time. Of course, you had the main line, the Omaha, the Sioux City line, Cedar Rapids line, and then in December 1986, they would buy from the Northwestern the line from Wall Lake, now called Ida Grove Junction on the Canadian National, out to Ida Grove, Iowa, which is become quite a big revenue maker today for the CN plus some different branches including the Marion branch which is of course that's the former Milwaukee Road mainline went right past my house and then you had trackage rights in the Chicago area over the IC to Plains for the coal trains and then down to Markham Yard for their freight trains and this is a map of what the, the Chicago Central looked like in 1986 and nothing's really changed too much today uh from the CN, other than the fact that uh, the line to Marion is, is gone, and uh, there's no, this is prior to the Wall Lake Ida Grove branch purchase, so. Right. But uh, pretty much this is all the same today for the most part. Okay, this is a slide I bought off eBay, and believe it or not, this is one of the first Chicago Central trains. I, uh, this is a, the, Fort Dodge to Waterloo local, taken at Duncombe, Iowa, December 27th of 1985. And I had acquired some train sheets from a retired uh, chief dispatcher in Waterloo, some early Chicago Central train dispatcher sheets. And one of those sheets was for this day, December 27th, 1985. And this train is picking up a cut of green cars out of Duncombe, uh, the Fort Dodge local, out of Fort Dodge going to Waterloo, t taking them, putting them on the train, and taking them on east to Waterloo. I thought that was kind of neat there. So, and you can see uh, no relettering of any Chicago Central power, or, you know, lettering on the on the, the Jeeps, Paducah Jeeps, just yet. So, right, yeah. And this is this was very very typical. They they operated four axle power. Yep. Lots of Paducah rebuilds. Hillbillies, we call them. Yep. Hillbillies. Uh, lots of former Milwaukee Road jeeps yep. that we'll, ended up on the property. We'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. So here's a photo I took. Uh, we were on a family ride up to East Dubuque in Dubuque one Sunday afternoon. And while the family was uh, checking out Mulgrew's, I went over to the East Cabin just kind of knocked on the door and I asked the operator if I could come in. He said, sure, why not? So I took a couple print, I had a print camera with me at the time. And this is the model board for East Cabin in East Dubuque, which is no longer there. The foundation, I think, is still there. And you have your webcam for Steel Highway there. Yeah, but, yeah looking right at about this location. Yes. So this is the model board uh, 
for East Cab, and you can see there's a train coming across the river right there because the board is lit up. Mm -hmm. And you'll have an eastbound that'll cross over uh, onto the eastward main here. And if you notice, there's a light in the middle on the BN center siding. There's some cars there. So that was kind of a neat little uh, place. I hung out there a few times back in the in the 90s and uh, got to know one of the operators there. He had worked with my great-grandfather on the Illinois Central. And one day he let me uh, run the plant for a few hours. Um, mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's, it was an interesting place, let's just say that. So No rule violations occurred during no, those hours? Not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> and here, I just took a picture here of like uh, the east end. This would be where I think it's called Murphy now on the BN. Uh, east end of the uh, center siding there at, e at East Cabin. And of course, you have one radio for the BN trains, and you have another radio for the Chicago Central trains there, and then you have the two dispatcher phones. One for the BN and one for the Chicago Central. And at that time, that was still being dispatched from Chicago. They didn't move to Waterloo to like later on in 1986. And all the greatest of mid-1980s technology on display yes, here. Yes, yes. <laughs> and here, this is just another shot of the, of the operator's desk there. You have the, the two silver boxes where the train order signals that controlled, the, controlled those signals. And you have the big patch board up there on the right. This is a Mark Lanusa photo. This is Waterloo in May of 1986. And as you talked about earlier, Tom, there's some Milwaukee Road Power being leased that would eventually be purchased by the Chicago Central. And, of course, you still have a lot of orange and white and some black in the in the photo there. So mm -hmm. that, that's a typical 1980s scene at Waterloo. Well, and I bring it up because this was within a few months of the Sioux Line taking over yep. the, Milwaukee Road, the Milwaukee Road, and suddenly they had a surplus of Jeeps that they were willing to lease out. Yeah, yep. and I believe that's a, a lot of the reason why they ended up with yep. Milwaukee Road Jeeps. Yeah. Here's the 8181. This is taken in Dubuque. Notice it's got two different heralds. It has the IC herald. Up front, and the Chicago Central sticker on the cab. So <laughs> I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Here's a Wilbur St. Peter photo of a coal train getting ready to leave Dubuque. It's got four Milwaukee Jeeps up front, and that uh, is the second Illinois Central Depot that was built in about 1942 or so. And this is where my family used to get on and ride the Amtrak Blackhawk. When it ran out of Dubuque from 1974 to 1981. Yeah. And then uh, this building and was knocked down to make way for US-151. And if you drive US-151 today, you're go driving right across that spot. That's right. Because these these track alignment ha actually have not changed very much. No. The tr so when you drive along there, the track is on your left side, for instance, as you're driving yes. east or, excuse me, west or south. Sure. So, yeah, you can actually imagine this is the U.S. 20 overpass going into East Dubuque. Right, right. Here's the same train again, and just give you a little bit more broadside of what they had for power on that on this day. So, Did they change crews here? Is that... I don't know uh, why they stopped here. It might be picking up... I don't know. I, there's nothing really... No really good information about this other than the train has stopped here for... Well, you were, you took the photo. No, you didn't. I, this is oh, Wilbur St. Peter. Oh, I'm sorry. All this right. Wilbur St. Peter. Fine. This is some Wilbur St. Peter. There's the same train again coming out of the tunnel there in East Dubuque with uh, the signal for the BN Diamond there at uh, East Cabin. Yes. Yeah, and that's long gone too. I see tri lights. And some neat signals the IC uh -huh. did. Yes, yes, yes. Same train again and uh, at Galena. This scene hasn't changed. Too much over the years. The depot is still there. Is it a welcome center? And uh, and I think that sign with the CC Herald, I think it's still there too. Could be. Could be. Here's 9420 at, uh, this is the Council Bluffs Roundhouse. A Bill Kuba photo from the fall of 1986 there, along with the 9415. Yes. Unrebuilt Jeeps. Yep. 9420 again this time this is in cedar rapids notice it's got a the ic herald but a different the black i and c and the white herald on there so. yeah and you can still kind of make out the white pinstriping yes along the the frame and the long hood yep yep 
which is 94.28 and 81.50. This is, of course, at Cedar Rapids again, 1986, with the old Iowa Electric power plant there in the background. All of this is pretty much long gone now and changed a lot. Mm -hmm. yep. Turntable pit over there on the left, too. Yep, yep. 94.28 again, just another roster shot. This is Council Bluffs in 1986. Bill Kuba photo again. 81, 69, and 80, 12. They're just doing a little switching there at the south end of the yard there in Council Bluffs. The northwestern yard would be where that grain elevator is at. Yeah. You can actually see how they put, it looks like they put an orange sticker over it. Yep. And then put a CC sticker over the, yeah. Yeah. Definitely, like the definition of a patchwork there. A patch job. Well, there are a lot yeah. of patch jobs on that road, let me tell you. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is about the only caboose shot I, I could find <clears throat> out of Bill's collection. This is the uh, 199.049 at Cedar Rapids. <clears throat> you know, CC also had cabooses that were painted red, uh, but I couldn't find any shots of any CC cabooses in red. I, all mm -hmm. I had was the black with the yellow ends. But still a neat color. Yeah. Here's the 9400. This is at Waterloo. This is a Wilbur St. Peter photo from 19, also 1986. You notice it says designated service do not occupy. So this is more or less a B unit than anything else. Right. Yeah. 1301. That was one of the two SWs that they had. This is also switching Waterloo uh, across East 4th Street there. Yeah, and we've got some trailer on flat car traffic here. Yes. CC operated ramps in uh, a lot of the bigger locations. Uh, Chicago, of course. Rockford, Dubuque, Waterloo. They even had a ramp in Cedar Rapids, too, for a mm -hmm. while. They also had a ramp in Fort Dodge and also had a ramp in Sioux City and Council Bluffs. So they were pretty heavy on piggyback traffic, even up yeah. after the merger, too. Right. Yeah. They didn't have any... I don't know that I've seen any container traffic. I think it was all, cha all trailers chassis. on chassis. Yes, it yeah. was. Yes. Of course, uh, we talked about the Star Clipper earlier. The Star Clipper did run into Waterloo uh, from Waverly and Osage. And the Star Clipper boarding area was the old 1967 built IC depot on East 4th Street after the C or I I Illinois Central mm -hmm. closed their depot downtown. So they had Amtrak service here, or excuse me, they had passenger service right up to the advent of right. Amtrak. Right, the Hawkeye ran until May 1st of 71. Right, and then so it got for, pulled. Then it got pulled, but the Hawkeye stopped here after 1967 until Amtrak came along in May of 71. Right. Yeah. Here's a Star Clipper there, uh, X Northwestern 407 on one end. They had another F on the other end there too, which we'll get to, I think. Yep, 416 right there. Yeah, they got both those off the C and W. I right, believe. they did. Were they out of? Were they actually out of commuter service? They. That's a good question. I'm not really sure. Somebody might might know here in the comment section if they, if you know, feel free yeah. to post. I mean, it would make sense if they if they would have been outfitted with head end power. Yeah, right? yeah. That yeah. they would have actually been commuter engines. Sure. And this is the same train. This is out uh, at what what they called Susie. That was the west end of the double track through Waterloo. Today, this would be C, uh, this would be Jackson yes. on the CN here. And, of course, at a signal bridge at the time and uh, typical IC signals for that era. So, mm -hmm. yep. Here is a cover of timetable number one, which was issued on December 7th of 1986. I think you still find some of these out there on eBay, but they want a lot of money for them. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the uh, map that was in that timetable. If you notice there, they got the wall late to Ida Grove line uh, already on the CC map because that was a late 1986 purchase. That's right. And that's just a little close up of, uh, you know, the wall lake line went through Odomolt, Arthur today, and Ar Ida Grove. Ida Grove loads grain trains still to this day today. And yeah. There's a nice big ethanol plant at Arthur, and they ship out a couple ethanol trains out of there a week. This is a marketing brochure I found on eBay, too. This is this was issued probably late 1986, early 1987. It's kind of a neat little uh, thing about Jack Haley there and 
some of the different marketing representatives and officers on the railroad and a nice photo of, a, of the 8019 going around the rock cut there just outside Dubuque. Yes. Yeah. Same marketing brochure uh, just talks about the railroad's heritage and what they have for employees and equipment. And, and then we talked about the intermodal facilities. They list the intermodal facilities right there. So here's the 975 and the 978. This is taken at Wallace Yard in Freeport in early 1987. Most of the, like we talked about on cabooses earlier, a lot of them, were, some of them were painted black with the yellow ends, but a lot of them, as you can see, were, were patch jobs too. Yep. And these were, were these also, I believe these were IC cabooses. They all were IC. That they just cabooses. inherited from. The IC, yes, yeah. yes. Here's a wheel report. I just thought this is kind of interesting. This is for the Fort Dodge Waterloo local on July 23rd of 1987. You can see they got the head end power there. Uh, some cars for Iowa Falls for the Cargill plant to be interchanged to the Northwestern there. Some dangerous placard cars. And, of course, there's a lot of covered hoppers there. Going to Dubuque for Pillsbury. And then there's a Delaware, Iowa car there and a Cedar Rapids and then the Waterloo uh, CC car and a caboose on that train too. So kind of an interesting yeah. little way. About 36 cars. So and here's a lineup. This was uh, when I scanned some uh, paperwork out of Mills Tower. This was in one of the uh, piles of paperwork I scanned. So it's just uh, an uh, Lineup for July 7th of 1987, showing what was coming that day between Waterloo and Council Bluffs. Lots of history. Yeah. Yeah. 971, of course, is taken in Cedar Rapids in uh, August of 1987. Probably a Cedar Rapids switch engine for that day. You can see Quaker Oats back there in the background, and you see the old off to the left. That was the Rock Island uh, depot that lasted you know, to the end of the Rock Island. But that's where the, after Union Station was closed in 1961, that's where the Rock Island uh, Zephyr Rocket stopped until its demise in 1967. Mm -hmm. And there's a 975 and a 974. Again, that's his Bill Cuba photos at Cedar Rapids. It's probably power for the Manchester turn that particular day. And this is an eBay slide I found. This is out in Council Bluffs. I think this is one, maybe two uh, Paducas that had Chicago Central in the... Uh, on yeah, the, the tall on, lettering on the long on hood. The, on the long hood in orange and white. Yeah. 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 So it's also interesting because these Paducah rebuilds, you know, we see them here. Yeah. But when we had Barry Anderson's program a couple of months ago to see it, seeing those on the early Iowa Interstate trains as well. Yes. These were... Um, these, these were pretty popular po popular power back then yeah yes he, 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 yes on the short lines for sure yep here's the timetable number two this was issued august 9th of 87 not much changed really as, as far as the uh, managers and anything like that jack haley is is still the president and but about a month later uh there was some of the company officers uh that are listed on there mm -hmm. uh, you know, area managers and mechanical foreman so jack haley and chicago central's primary leader ge capital were at button heads with the with each other and expenses they were exceeding over revenue and a new management team was created by ge capital and he and haley well he felt threatened so on, on the 4th of september of 1987 chicago central filed bankruptcy and jack haley resigned a week later on September 11th of 1987. It was big news in, here in Iowa. And then GE Capital restructured its debt, reduced employees and new management, mostly made former uh, Burlington Northern people uh, came in and kind of reshaped the company and uh, reduced train miles and employees and so forth. So Now, this was Chicago Central's experiment with six acts of power. This is taken in Council Bluffs in late 1987. Uh, I can't remember offhand how many of these were leased by the CC. I want to say maybe eight. And I, I might be wrong. Somebody might want to comment there that might remember. But they tried out some of these SDP 
P45s and SD45s that were on Conrail, Erie Lackawanna that were on the Paducah and Louisville. They used them primarily on coal trains. And I can remember one night, uh, I was with a friend in Fort Dodge because I went to college up there at Iowa Central. And we were down at the depot one night, and here come a headlight with a westbound hopper train. It had a Paducah lead because you had to have cab signals between Waterloo and Fort Dodge for the automatic train stop. And behind the Paducah was three of these big X Conrail 45s. I'm like, what in the heck is this? And then I, I found out later they were on a short-term lease. Uh -huh. So that's the only photo I have of any of these in my collection. But I know uh, some people caught them in working service between Waterloo and, and, and Freeport. So Right. Yeah. Well, and those coal trains didn't last forever either. They, um, I believe that when the coal train traffic went away. They ran the coal train traffic right up, up until the end. But uh, a lot of times they'd bring the whole train into Waterloo and then they would split it to get it over the hills between Waterloo to Freeport and, and then put them back together then, and then run mm -hmm. it into Chicago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here's one of the first repainted Chicago Central locomotives, the 1585 downtown Cedar Rapids there in uh, September of 1988. And you can see that uh, just come out of the paint shop. Very bright. Very bright. Yeah. Yes. Bill Cuba photo there. Here's a Rick Anderson photo uh, of an eastbound grain train, I think, coming off the Sioux City line, coming into Fort Dodge to pick up a message. This is couple days before Christmas of 1988 kind of a classic railroad scene where you have the operator uh, holding up the train order fork and uh, conductor head brakeman's gonna pick up the orders or a message there and yeah keep going east that's a beautiful depot too uh, fortunately unfortunately it was torn down after the IC repurchased the CC so right yeah it's a Don Vaughn photo uh, of course this is Mills Tower way back in the day before we had webcams and <laughs> right. like that. So before the historical society got a hold of it, this yeah. is a, this is an operational tower. Yes, yeah, so that's Jeff Gifford there. Uh, this is probably early 1989 when this photo was taken there at Mills. You can see there's a message in the train order fork, so the uh, engineer is going to be mm -hmm. picking up a train order there. For and you can see the the bottom fork was for, was for the uh, cabooses, but they didn't use that uh, bottom fork very much. Well, right. Were they were they done using cabooses by this time? They maybe? had cabooses on locals, but through okay. freights had had either you know electronic marker, right? EOT. Yep. Not sure if that's Jeff Gifford there. It's somebody that's working. That might be maybe Bob Scadden. I don't know. That's inside the Mills Tower. That's I believe that's the hot box reader for Macy there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just a general picture. It's March of 1989, you can tell by the calendar. Mm -hmm. That's what the operator's desk looked like. You got radios there, dispatcher's phone, city telephone, and of course the light there on the desk, desktop light. And there's Jeff Gifford there, work. So it looks like this photo was taken on March 18th of 1989 there by Don Vaughn. So, and you know what? Not much has changed inside there since the, since the tower was closed. Really? Yeah, they preserved it really well. They did. They did. There's another night photo taken by Don of Mills. Yep. Yeah. So now in this case, this is this would be the former Rock Island, the CNW. That's the spot in, line. Or yeah, short in line. front of us. And then the CC is way over here on the right side. Yeah, and of course you got to picture the fencing that's around there now too. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So here's a system, here's a cover of uh, number three timetable. From April 2nd of 1989. And then I scanned some paperwork from Mills. This is kind of like a station record of trade movements for May 1st of 1989. You can say, uh, mm -hmm. even back then, CC was still kind of a busy railroad at the time. You have, looks like five westbounds and three eastbounds and 24, eight trains. Yeah. That's better than it is today, I think. But where's the loading? I mean, yeah. are they running eight trains with 25 cars each? Yeah. Yeah, there's no loading on there either. So no. that's you, know, you got to always ask that question. Sure, sure. But you see one of them up there, that 8032 is a local there. Mm -hmm. And 8258 uh, 
that's train 50. That was the train between Council Bluffs and Chicago. And then the 81, 71 looks like that's a unit grain train from, from Western Iowa there. So and here's a operator's line up there between uh, Fort Dodge and uh, Mill, or Fort Dodge and 370. So, um, and, ah, how am I going to say this? Between Fort Dodge and, uh, and Cedar Falls Junction there. There you for, go. For, there you go. For May 1st of 1989. So lots of history on there. And here's another wheel report. Uh, this looks like it's for train 70, which is the Fort Dodge Waterloo local. Not a very big train this day. Only 25 cars and about 1,500 tons. But there's some Blairsburg cars there. Mm -hmm. Here's another Rick Anderson photo. This is taken at Denison uh, in July of 1989. You got a work train on the siding with the 8058 and 8134. And we have an empty hopper train going to the UP with the 1743 in the lead. And all the scene, uh, except for the sign, is long gone today. Both the depot and the tool house there are, are long gone. And, uh, but the packing plants on either, uh, in the background, both of those are still there. Yep. Yep. So... And I believe the way that the CN is operating now, this is actually the spot where they swap, swap crews. crews. Yes, they do. Because this highway overpass, they're standing under the highway overpass looking right. at this. Rick's looking down on the track there. Yep. Yeah, you can still take photos off that highway if you're brave enough to brave do it. Brave enough to do it. I'm not <laughs> yeah. brave enough to do it, so I'd rather stay on the ground. Right. So. Now, this is the first run of what the what we call the Faulkner line. This is the former MNC now that ran out of Marshalltown through Ackley up to Hampton and Mason City. Well, the Northwestern abandoned this line uh, in early 1989 and a shippers group purchased it uh, both sides of Ackley, north and south. Mm -hmm. And so a couple times a week the Waterloo Fort Dodge local would run up towards Hampton I didn't go quite to Hampton. I think it went to Faulkner. That's about the furthest it went. And picked up and set out grain cars here. And also picked up and set out south of Ackley, too. So they they didn't run on this line very much, I believe, after the, uh, the shippers group took over. And now today, this is all gone except for the one little stretch of the Iowa River runs between the ethanol plant at Steamboat Rock up to Ackley to the CN. That's right. You can see that a lot of times they have their power parked right next to Highway 20. Yes, they do. When you drive new Highway 20, at least. Yes. Yeah. And that, it just dead ends right there. Right right there, yeah. 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 Here's a photo of the mechanical crew uh, in Waterloo that rebuilt this 1744. This is taken in, in September 1989 by Ricky Anderson. It's a nice little employee photo of everybody that worked in the shop at the time. It's another Rick Anderson photo. We talked about the cabooses earlier. There's another one, 1948 mm -hmm. and a 1301, which is outside of its normal place in Waterloo. This is at Hawthorne Yard there in Chicago, just outside Chicago. Yep. It looks cold. It that does. looks cold there, too. This is taken from Rick's office in the old office building in Waterloo. A couple days before Christmas in 1989. Looks like that's a, excuse me hopper train there and you can see there's a big cut of piggyback cars in the yard there too 1600 was a former katie jeep uh eight and they used this uh, mostly for switching i caught it a few times in cedar rapids here switching the yard uh this is taken in iowa falls in early 1990 there here's one of my early not best pictures but this is train 51 meeting a work train at Beth, at the west end of Beth, in uh, February of 1990. A lot of power on that 51 that day, moving back to Waterloo. You didn't get the classic shot at the overhead bridge at no, Beth. No, no. Everybody goes to that overhead bridge, and they yeah. still do today. Right. But some of us, you know, hey, you can go down to the west end. There's a crossing there. So, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a cool picture that Rick Anderson took in 50, leaving Waterloo. If you look at that billboard, look, listen, and live, it's a tie, you lose. So, yeah. yeah, a little bit of color on that power, too. Now, here is another photo that I took, which you can't recognize today. This is uh, Cedar Rapids Switch Engine, 
coming into Marion Yard in uh, April of 1990. Uh, when uh, Milwaukee pulled out of Marion, the Illinois Central Gulf took over. And in Marion, they had two customers, the Junkyard, Cat Salvage, or Marion Iron. Mm -hmm. And then also they had the Brent. Prince Agra. Yeah, the co-op. Co and the Ann Lynn co-op, yep, for mm -hmm. liquid fertilizer. So, yeah. So they'd come to Marion probably, oh, I don't know, three times a week at least, come up and switch, and then go back into Cedar Rapids. So this scene is all gone now. You can tell that I got the back of the Burger King parking lot, and back there is the old co-op gas station too, which is long gone as well. So right. So they they did they ran this out to 44th Street in Marion? So I think it was only went right? to 35th. Oh, 35th, 35th Street. 35th is where, yes, that's where the co-op was at. And okay. They, and that's how they got into the co-op. Yep. Sure. And then after that, they tore it out there. So. Well, right. It's cut all the way back now to where there's just a really short stub yeah. off the connection at Louisa. Yep. To, the, to get to that one sheetrock place. Yes. Yes. And that's, that's, that's all it. that's left. That's all that's left. Maybe a mile of track. Yeah. We talked about the Highway 151 relocation in Dubuque. Here's what it looked like in April of 1990 with Train 51 coming into Dubuque there. And you can see they're already starting to uh, tore up some of the right of way and starting to build the highway there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of a neat photo. Yeah. Let's take it at 9th Street in Marion of the 1600 uh, ex-Katie Jeep there uh, approaching downtown Marion. Of course, this scene is long gone now you it's bike trail now bike trail now and you can see little caesar's pizza back mm -hmm. there which is now zio johnno's right in marion yeah and that's looking east towards uh downtown marion there uh and all this is completely changed now because sixth avenue was just one way going west back then now it's both directions Yep, and you can see there's a little bit of the uh, main track number two, eastbound there. main. Yep, left that I don't. Part of the platform was still in there too. Right. Yeah, yeah. This taken. This is a Bill Cuba photo. This is taken at Hiawatha of the Manchester turn leaving Cedar Rapids. A couple of red jeeps there in April of 1990. Yep, working hard to pull up grade here. Yep, yeah. I'm trying to think. Would this have been? Would he have been taking this from Blair's Ferry Road? Uh, I want to say this is north of Blair's Ferry. Because you see that there's traffic signals down there. That's oh, got to yeah. be Blair's Ferry. I, this got to be north of Blair's Ferry. All right. Here's another rebuild. Uh, eventually it would become the Chicago Central 1742. This is outside the Waterloo Roundhouse in May of 1990. That Strip. is quite the rebuild project yes it is you can see they chopped the nose on it and everything like yeah. that yeah here's the 1806 at waterloo in october of 1990 mm -hmm. looking good this is at Kearney, iowa just outside cherokee on the sioux city line they had they did a lot of track work on this line in the late 80s and early 1990s it's a ballast train there in the Kearney siding and Rick was out here, Rick Anderson is out here for a little Golden Spike ceremony in Storm Lake that uh, that celebrated the completion of all this rail rehabilitation on this line. So, And that's the, the Golden Spike train at Storm Lake that same day, November 5th of 1990, with a pair of fresh Jeeps and a pair of fresh hoppers and a, a CC caboose there. So, yeah. Yeah. There it is right there, 199. Going away shot. Going away shot. Yep, yep. So in late 1990, GE began trying to market these four-axle, smaller, Super 7, uh, GE, C, I forgot what the model designation, but they're Super 7. C30-7, does that sound right? It might be, I don't know. But yeah. Um, but they tried to market these to all the like regionals and short lines. And believe it or not, the Iowa Interstate had this 2000 and 2002 first back in the fall of 1990 for about a month, month and a half. And then these two came up to the Chicago Central and worked up there for a while throughout the late fall and early winter. This is taken at Waterloo 
on December 4th. The two, uh, you can see there's an X Mop, two of them, X Helm or X Mop Helm leasers. And the CC had leased at the time too. They used those in service as well. So okay. So I got a phone call from Nick Tharlson one Sunday. He happened to be working at Kalon. Wait, he called you? He called me. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. He called me on a Sunday because uh, he was working at Kayhawk, and I was to relieve him at 3 o'clock that day. He, goes, he called me says, hey, take your camera down to the CC roundhouse because you're gonna. there's a couple C uh, those Super 7 boats sitting there. So they just brought these, uh, come down from Manchester with the grain train, and they were going to turn one of the engines... Uh, to go back to Manchester. So I took a couple of roster shots. And this is just one of them here uh, on the turntable there at Cedar Rapids. So the six axle variants were C30 7s, which is what I thought. Okay. But those were the six axles. Yeah. They had a four axle version of it that they considered a 23 7. Okay. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. And they're on, I think, Milwaukee Road frames, if I remember somebody telling me that so oh yeah yeah, I, yeah th because these were these were out of a GE rebuild program. they were they were yeah yeah here's another shot of uh, a couple of engines on the Cedar Rapids turntable in early 1991 1601 and the 8169 Rick Anderson is on a plow extra from Waterloo to uh, Fort Dodge here and this is at uh, Ackley, and this scene has changed quite a bit. But as you can see, the diamond for the Evans St. L is still in at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's been replaced with switches now. Switches now, yes, to and access the yeah, big Iowa turnouts. River. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So you want to go to the next slide? That, that's the same uh, going west. This is uh, meeting train 50 at Mills, and it used to be. There used to be a north and a south siding at Mills at one time. And I think the, uh, they use the north siding now. That south siding was taken out probably, I want to say, early to mid-90s. But a lot of times meets were on, you know, a lot of trains met on the north siding. So Sure. Yeah. Same train, uh, train 50 there at Mills. Bitter cold day, that's. Same train with a little uh, at Judd, uh, just between Fort Dodge and Duncan. They're going to wide the plow there, then head back to Waterloo. So, Webster City, Iowa, that's where the CC crossed the northwestern line from uh, uh, Ames through Jewel Junction up to Eagle Grove. Used to be a tower here at one time, way back when in the IC days. But this train 50. Uh, coming across the diamonds there at Webster City in early 1991. Here's one of the former Milwaukee Road Jeeps that got painted in the Chicago Central Colors, 1878, X978, <coughs> at Waterloo. Now here's a coal train up at Council Hill, Illinois. Or, no, nah, it's train 50, I'm sorry. But you can see there's a Monogahelia uh, Jeep 38 and a X Mop. 38 back there, and this is the time when uh, Chicago Central was still leasing those GE Super 7s, but I had also purchased five of these X Monogahela Jeep 38s as well. They've got, I mean, this is a colorful consist. I don't know if you got another shot of it, but I think that's a Milwaukee Road Jeep. The Milwaukee Jeep and a red and one back there. A red CC Jeep. Yeah. A little bit of everything. A little bit of everything in that photo, yep. Uh, this is Berwyn, Illinois, on the westbound, going across the BN uh, racetrack at uh, Chicago in early 1991. I can remember, Tom, when mm -hmm. riding the Blackhawk uh, from Dubuque to Chicago. One of the cool things when you got into Chicago was crossing the other railroads. You know, you, yeah. you cross the BRC on a diamond, and you cross the Milwaukee at Genoa, Illinois, but... It's always neat to cross the BN here and see what was in the BN yard. Sometimes you might see a, a commuter train, sometimes you see a freight train, but it's kind of neat, you know. And I've gone underneath this bridge a few times, right at the BN and Amtrak. So I, I've, I've been on both both rail lines. So, right. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's an Oakway. It is. Down there. It is down there. And that's today, that'd be BNSF's 
piggy backyard. Yeah. In Chicago, or one of them anyway. Yeah, I think that's an Oakway on a westbound. It, it looks is. Like. It is. You are correct. <clears throat> Here is uh, soon to be CC two thousand nine. They bought this inter uh, Intermountain Gas Industries G thirty eight. So sitting in Dubuque in uh, April 1991. And this will become later CC 2009. Okay, so I was home one day, uh, day off from work, and was watching Channel 9 News at noon, and they had just had a, a breaking news story that a Chicago Central train hit a road grader on the east side of Independence. So I ran up to Independence that right drove up there and got some wreck photos of uh, this hopper train that hit this road grader. So there's a couple, there's an ex-Milwaukee Jeep in the ditch down there and had a couple of these Monogahelias in the consist, but not really too much damage to the 1744, just to the pilot pretty much. I don't know. That pilot's bent back an awful long way. I, yeah, yeah. I, could have been I think there's some damage to the wheels and the traction there motors be, back there, there too. Be. I don't. I didn't get to that other side. So. Yeah. 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 There's the 2004 in the ditch there. Yep. And then if you look, there's the 968. There's another Jeep in the ditch too. So I think there's like four engines on this hopper train. I just walked right up there and and took pictures until the. You can't account. Sheriff said, hey, you got to go. I said, okay. Yeah. Yeah. 1301 again. This is in Waterloo. Switching there at East 4th Street. And you can see some, the piggyback ramp back there in the background. Yeah. Looks he's, like he's got a scale test car. Yes, he does. Here's uh, another Rick Anderson photo from his office of the 1301. And some power line around the engine facilities there in Waterloo old steam engine tender back there too yeah converted into a snow plow yeah yeah here's 50 coming into waterloo with four jeep 38s three of them in red with one of that monaga hill at 2004 mm -hmm. sticks out here's the 1700 uh just out of the shot before it got repainted you can see where they did the chop nose and everything like that on there yeah and uh, 51, they added a couple more hillbillies. So they had six engines out of Waterloo. So this is at Dyersville at the west end of the siding there. And then uh, it met 51. And I shot that at Manchester. And that's 13, 13 engines on that train, I believe. No kidding. No kidding. Yeah. The Manchester Depot is still there, too. And Freight House, yep. Uh -huh. the depot was still there at the time, yeah. That scene's changed a lot today, too. It has. Here's 51 getting ready to leave Water, or, yeah, Waterloo there at the east end of the yard. Here's a Cedar Rapids train at Robbins going north to Manchester with 1775 and a couple more Paducahs back there. Mm -hmm. And it even had a caboose. Very nice. You couldn't tell it was occupied or not. I didn't see anybody in there. Yeah. Buke switch engine at East Cabin. Uh, that, and, uh, you can notice here they're redoing uh, the US 20 bridge at that time. This is like September 1991 when this was taken. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you have a coal train coming across, headed to Chicago with six engines there. Get up the hills there in northwestern Illinois. And this 51 had a lot of power in this day, too. There's, let's see, six. About nine engines on that train, I want to say. Yeah, quite yeah. a few. It looks like a couple of those might be dead in tow going to Waterloo. Probably, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go on on a limb there and say those those Milwaukee Road engines might not be operating. That could be. That could be. And that's the same train that's at the east end of Piasta mm -hmm. uh, with the old signal. Can't, yeah, signal Can't train, lever signal. Can't lever signal there, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And this is 50 at Dyersville in February of 1992 there, the west end of the siding. And here we have, this is a trip that Craig Williams, believe it or not, and I made up to Dubuque one Sunday. So our first train was this hopper train uh, coming out of Dubuque, or the tunnel there at East Dubuque. 
mm-hmm. about the hammer to me in. We followed this guy up the hill of the Piasta. This is Fremont Street, I want to say, in Dubuque. I think this is an overpass is here now. Yeah. I want to say. <coughs> and that's the old wigwag that was up there on the hill outside Piasta. Long gone now. Train 50, or yeah, Train 50, uh, outside East Dubuque, they're heading east. And this is a nighttime photo at Waterloo taken by Rick Anderson. And then for a few months in 1992, they leased about, uh, Chicago Central did, 10 of these Conrail Jeep 40s. They some, Sometimes they could lead, and, and but between Waterloo and, and Fort Dodge, they couldn't lead because of uh, train stop. So this is 71's power, which is the Waterloo Dubuque local. Um, about to tie onto its train at Waterloo and then head west. And that's coming past the broom factory there in Cedar Falls. Merlin's Curve. Merlin's Curve. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is a Mark Lanusa photo. This is at Munger, uh, Munger, Illinois, just outside Chicago. Eastbound train there. And I uh, said some of this, sometimes this Conrail power could lead where there wasn't any cab signal territory here. So here's Four of those Conrail leasers on a hopper train out at Munger there, just outside Chicago. And here's another Conrail leading Mm -hmm. westbound train 51 there at Munger. So one day I went across the street from my parents' house and I heard the Cedar Rapids switch engine coming. So I went and got a picture and the uh, crew decided they liked to hand it up for Mm -hmm. the camera. So Nice. Yeah. So, and you can see right there in the lower left, or yeah, left hand corner, part of the, the eastbound or main two is still in place there. Well, right. It hasn't been used for over a decade at this point. Right, right. And it's, yeah, pretty overgrown. It is overgrown. And now it's a bike trail. So, yeah. yeah. Here's timetable number four cover uh, with the 2000 uh, from 1992. Here's the 2005 on train. 50. This is just outside of Jessup here in May of 1992. And here's counterpart 51 in the hole meet, waiting to meet 50 at Jessup there. And you can see much power on this, including some Conrail leasers in there too. 51 again, just outside Jessup, heading west towards Waterloo at Raymond. Here's Cedar Rapids Manchester train uh, at Robbins uh, one Sunday. This is actually a Sunday in the daytime going north uh, in June of 1992 here. Power line up at uh, Waterloo from Rick Anderson, summer of 1992. Little little color in that photo. Yeah, lots of variety. Lots of variety. Yep, here's a Bill Cuba photo of the 1700. This is taken down, of course, here at Cedar Rapids. A little color in there. Now, I, this is kind of unique. This is two ex-Milwaukee Jeeps on ex-Milwaukee trackage here in Marion, believe mm-hmm. it or not, on the Cedar Rapids switch engine. So that's coming into Marion there with a car for Prince Agra and then empty guns for Marion Iron. And then here's the same concept coming back on, right off the of 6th Avenue at 9th Street. So I just thought that was kind of unique. Man, those Milwaukee wheels are getting to be looking pretty well, ratty. Well, they got red pretty ratty by this the time. Yes, yeah. they did. Yes, they did. Here's 51 with another ratty Milwaukee <laughs> at Hilltop there on the east side of Waterloo with the old signal bridge there. Yes. You know, I, I remember my friend Gay Williams always used to say, shoot it now because today's junk is tomorrow's treasure. That's, <laughs> that's, yes. Yeah, that's what I say. And again, here's another day where the Cedar Rapids switcher had two Milwaukee engines and they came up to Marion. So coming back west along 6th Avenue there. And it even had a ratty uh, caboose, even with the IC logo on it, on this one too. So, yeah. Yeah. It was a good match right there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> they really matched them up well. It is. This is a Bill Kuba photo of the 1505 at uh, Council Bluffs. You can see the Northwestern uh, Coal Tower there in the background. Mm-hmm. 
It's another Craig Williams trip. I think we went to Mason City this day, and we heard this guy leaving Waterloo on our way back to Waterloo. So this is at New Hartford, Iowa, empty grain train at the west end of New Hartford there. And this is a Rick Anderson photo that he took from a plane uh, flying around Council Bluffs in Omaha. That's Omaha there in the distance. And Epley Airfield in the background. I found this on eBay too. This was, uh, they sent this 2003 up to the Wisconsin Central Shop in North Fond du Lac for some uh, electrical work. So this is leading a Wisconsin Central train just outside of Van Dyne, Wisconsin, a southbound. So it's kind of a rare shot to see a CC Jeep 38 leading a WC train. So yeah. I thought that's kind of neat. A harbinger of things to come. Yes. Yes, because all would fall under the mm -hmm. CN banner later on. Here's That's the 8134 right. Dubuque switch engine coming out of the tunnel there at East Dubuque. And this was the last Chicago Central timetable before uh, the IC reacquired the line. This is from 1994. This is also from uh, summer 94. This is Cedar Rapids switch engine coming back from Marion mm -hmm. in Cedar Rapids there. This is a Rick Anderson photo of uh, eastbound coal train off the Omaha, Maine at Terra, uh, about to hit the Northwestern. You can see a Northwestern local there from Fort Dodge waiting. And uh, the signals here have changed, but the Terra Depot, I was just up there uh, last weekend, it's still standing, just barely. Right, it's just it's different. in pretty sad shape. It is in pretty sad shape. Yes. And uh, let's see here. I'm looking at this. I think we've got a, a Northwestern G G38. G38. Yeah, yeah. 4600. So those are standard power mm -hmm. up on their branch lines for a lot of years. Yep. Yep. So John Leopard photo I, I purchased off eBay of Train 50. This is taken just uh, to the west of Ackley, Iowa, in the summer of 1995. Now uh, we're getting into the IC era. So the um, IC repurchased the Chicago Central in February of 1996. And I can't remember what their purchase price was, but it was in the three-digit millions. I want to say maybe $175 million. Mm -hmm. I might be wrong. Somebody will correct me on it. But uh, once the IC uh, repurchased the line, you started seeing IC power here and there. So here's a grain train at Seward, Illinois, uh, in February 96, taken by Lance Wales, 2002 leading. But you can see back there, you got a couple dust stars and a Paducah trailer. All right, this is at Terra again. This is taken from the Denison Turn that Ricky Anderson is on. And looks like you got a couple Paducahs there in Terra on the five uh, on the five and ten tracks. And some grain hoppers waiting to either go east or west there. And... About this time when the IC took over, you started seeing some run through power, like this UP power on this empty coal train. This had taken at Seward, Illinois in April 96. And here's another coal, eastbound coal train uh, at uh, Warren, Illinois. You can, you can see a couple Paducahs back there, but then you got a UP SD50 or 60 and a newer, at that time, 9700 lead. Oh, yeah, those AC 4400s would have been brand spanking brand new, spanking new. Yep. at that time. Yeah, yeah. Here's the depot and the uh, Freeport local at uh, Freeport, Illinois, in mm -hmm. May of 1986 there. Has this depot survived, or was it taken down? I'm actually I not sure. I think it's still there. Somebody will, will mention it in the comments, yeah. I'm sure. But uh, to my knowledge, I think it's still there. Here's some power at Cedar Rapids. You can see a couple uh, IC Jeeps back there uh, in June of 1996. Bill Kuba photo. Another Bill Kuba photo uh, from September of 96. Not much really changed at the beginning. You still saw a lot of Chicago Central power, but as 97 and 98 kind of took place, you started seeing more IC power. Here is a uh, coal train off the BN at Council Bluffs. Uh, taken at Fort Dodge. 
with a Paducah laden for train stop, but then you can see in the background down there, you have the old IC Freight House, long gone. But the yard still is pretty much the same. It's just a lot of the buildings are long gone now. I mean, they, they, there was the 96. The Barf Bonnet. The Bar Barf Bonnet, yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That thing was a one of a kind. A one of a kind deal, yep. Mm hmm. Yep, yep. And here's a uh, kind of a moody shot I took at uh, Ackley on my way back from Don Vaughn's place, um, waiting for a, a westbound empty green train here at Ackley. It's got a high green across the M and St. L. And if you go to the next photo, there's that train, 1765, and a IC 40 Death Star there trailing. So, yeah. Yeah. Central City, Iowa Depot. This is my great grandfather worked here at one time as an Illinois Central agent. And a couple of years ago, uh, Chris Gopel, who uh, some of you know, cleaned out a few IC depots and came across some REA Express paperwork that had my great grandpa's signature on there. So he oh. gave that to me. Came out of Central City, probably early 1940s, I want to say. Okay. A couple more shots here, and then we'll wrap it up. This is uh, at Wallace Yard there in Freeport. Some Death Stars on an eastbound grain train right before the new year in uh, late 1996. And the final shot here is kind of uh, transitioning from Chicago Central to the Illinois Central. This is also at Freeport on December 28th of 1996. That's a Lance Wales photo of the 2000 uh, going west and the 1018 waiting to go east into Chicago. And with that, that concludes the Chicago Central and Pacific. Well, thank you, Dave. We appreciate your contributions as always. Thank you. Yes. And um, make sure and come back next. Next month is going to be July. Yes. When you watch this in June, next month is going to be July. And we're going to have Dana Grief show. In that July. is correct. He's going to have a program for us from some Western Iowa and, and uh, yep. that area. Yep. So, all right. Thank you, Dave. And we will catch you again in the future.